Now we're going to start looking at what the um, quantities in chemistry are going to be doing for us. Uh, we're going to start with a number concept today called the mole. <clears throat> so of course the question is, what's a mole? And we look at a mole and we say, okay, well, yeah, it's no, it's not one of these. They're they're cute and all, but um, it, it's something a little different. Let me start with asking you the question, what's a dozen? Um, everybody knows what a dozen is, right? Twelve of something, right? Well, a mole is a lot like that. It's really just a number. So instead of saying a dozen eggs, I could say I have a mole of eggs. Um, no, that's an awful lot of eggs. The difference here is that instead of just being a number like 12, the number is an awful lot bigger. Number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. That is a mind-boggling number and very difficult to wrap your brain around how that number is, how big that number really is. So what we're going to do in this note is just try and figure out, okay, let's kind of wrap our brains around how big this number is and what kind of calculations can we do with it. All right, so for starters, we're going to use this number for looking at particles, because really when we're looking at atoms and molecules, we're looking at particles that are so small you cannot see them with the naked eye. And the number of particles that you can actually see are quite significant. And this is where the mole really comes into its own. So that's the unit. Um, we use Avogadro's constant which is the number of moles, or number of particles per mole, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. Um, Avogadro is credited with having first discovered what this quantity is. We've since uh, added quite a few more decimal places to it in terms of precision. However, um, we're just going to use this number here, 6.022 times 10. Uh, you'll find that even some textbooks go to 6.02, um, just to simplify things a little bit more, but uh, we'll stick with the 6.022 times 10 to 23. All right, so what this means is if I have a mole of carbon atoms, then I have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon. It's really straightforward. Um, so how do we use calculations for this? Um, the simple equation is that n is equal to n times Na. Um, lots of n's here, so let's differentiate them. The capital N is the number of particles, the lowercase n is the number of moles, and the n sub a is, of course, Avogadro's constant. All right, so uh, this is where um, we need to bring in the idea of using our calculators properly, because the calculators um, are really required um, in order to do these kinds of calculations, there, there's very few people that can do this sort of thing, even with a pen and piece of paper. Um, all right, let's do our first example. How many atoms are in 3.67 moles of chlorine? So this is chlorine atoms, you'll notice it's not Cl2. All right, using our formula, N equals N times Na. Substitute in the values, lowercase n is the number of moles, 3.67. Uh, Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23. Multiply those together, and we get 2.210074 times 10 to the 24 atoms. Round to sig digs. In this question, the number given is three significant digits, so our answer has to be that as well. 2.21 times 10 to the 24. All right. Um, now, try this with your calculator. All right, so here we have an array of calculators. It's important that we learn how to use these calculators for um, figuring out the questions that are related to scientific notation. It's amazing how I find that um, every year um, somebody doesn't know how to work their calculator. So. Um, we fall into these four different kinds of calculators, and really there's only three variations on this. 
the first one is where you actually have the button on there that has the times 10 to the whatever uh, your exponent happens to be. So in, in case of uh, Avogadro's number, we would punch in, in this case, let me turn that on. Um, Um, 6.022 uh, times 10 to the 23. So that's how that number gets punched in there. Um, a lot of people will try to go times 10 and then use the um, exponent button, which on this particular calculator is up here um, with shift log. Um, and that, in some cases, will actually factor in an extra times 10 to the, and so you don't want to do that. Um, the other variations of these calculators, um, for those of you who have the sharps, um, you actually use the exponent button. So you would go 6.022, and then you use this exponent button here, EXP. And that puts in a times 10 to the, and leaves two little numbers there for you to fill in. And so the 23 then gets punched in like that. Okay, and so that means times 10. And you can see some of them will have the times 10 to the whatever uh, the exponent happens to be. Um, some of them have the exponent button as EXP as well, but down here at the bottom, like these Casios. And so same sort of thing, 6.022 and then you hit EXP, and it puts a little E there instead of the times 10 to the 23. The E it means the same thing. And so then we go 23, and now I can use that number. So for example, in our first uh, question, we had um, this number now times 3.67, and then equals, and that gives you the value there. Um, Let's do the same thing for this one, just so that we uh, see what it looks like. So then times uh, 3.67 equals, there you go, same number, um, times 3.67 equals, okay, same number. These uh, Texas Instruments ones are a little bit weird. Uh, they have a double E button um, instead of the EXP. The double E is the same uh, essentially uh, um, operation that you need to do. And so this one would be 6.022 double E and then 23. It leaves out the times 10 to it, but you can see that the exponent is the raised value. Okay, and then I'm going to multiply that times 3.67 equals and there's the same thing. Now you just got to be wa you watch that and understand on these TIs that it means times 10 to the 24. Okay, um, it's really important that you get that right. As I said, some people like to go uh, 6.022 and then go times 10 and then use the hat and um, or the so this one has the times 10 to the raised to the exponent and then punch in the exponent. And in some calculators that will actually uh, create a problem in that your exponent ends up being uh, bigger by a factor of 10. And that's going to mess you up. So make sure you know how to do this properly on whichever calculator you have. Um, one of the things that we have issues with is that people have a tendency to not use their calculators well. Um, so inserting here, um, I'm going to put a little video on how to use your calculator. Uh, pay attention to it. It's important. All right, second example. How many moles of uh, in um, 9.87 times 10 to 45 atoms of hydrogen? So this is just the same equation, uh, but we're going to reverse, uh, rearrange it so that we figured out the lowercase n number of uh, moles. So that's equal to n over na. And so that looks at 2, 9.87 times 10 to 25 divided by Avogadro's number. And that is going to work out to 1.639 times 10 to the 2 moles. 
again rounding to three signings because the 9.87 is three significant digits and that's 1.64 times 10 to the 2 moles you could here in fact some of your calculators when they give you the answer will probably give you 164 uh, or 163.9 whatever however many decimal places and that's not wrong okay um Generally, when I have numbers in scientific notation, I will give my answer in scientific notation as well. That's not always necessary to do, especially with some of the smaller numbers like 164. That's fine. Okay. Okay, the next thing that we want to cover on quantities is a concept called molar mass. Now, in the last note, we talked about the number of moles, and um, now we want to know. Uh, what what is the mass of a mole of something and there's a number of ways we can figure this out well, first of all let's start with the definition <clears throat> molar mass is given the symbol capital M and so the mass of one mole of an element or a compound is simply what we call the molar mass uh, an example if I have uh, an atom of copper up till now, we've looked at it as 12 U, 12 atomic mass U. Well, it turns out that, that number that we have on the periodic table, um, if you look up the um, under the legend um, what that value is, it actually says molar mass uh, instead of atomic mass. And so how we see that number then is that it's the mass of one mole of a substance. The atomic mass is the mass in atomic mass units of one atom but it happens to be also the mass of one mole of the substance in grams so we use that same number for both of those um, types of quantity so every element has its own molar mass and we use that molar mass to convert uh, the number of moles to mass and vice versa. So here's how the calculations work. First of all, the formula is the mass is equal to the number of moles times the molar mass. Usually it's written out in this way, M equals capital M times N. Or sometimes in lowercase n, the M and the N, the capital M and the, and the N are Obviously, the, um, the order doesn't matter. So, lowercase m is the mass. The unit is in grams. The capital M is our molar mass. And this unit is grams per mole. And then we have the number of moles, which we already talked about. Alright, so if I have, let's say, half a mole of sulfur, what's going to be the mass of that quantity. So I'll use my mass is equal to 32.06 grams per mole. I get that off the periodic table. Look that up. And I'm going to multiply that by the number of moles, 0.5. And so that's going to give me 16.03 grams of the mass. Um, now because we had only two significant digits in our question, uh, we need to round this number to two significant digits. So that 16 grams. Another example. How many moles are present in a hundred or sorry, a 10 gram sample of iron? So this time we're looking for the number of moles. So we're going to rearrange so that n is equal to lowercase m over capital M. 10 grams divided by 55.85 grams per mole. Again, that 55.85 grams, we get that off the periodic table. That works out to 0 0.17905102 grams, oh, sorry, number of moles um, of iron. Um, and again, we have to round to, in this case, because it's 10.0 grams, um, we're going to use 0 grams. We're going to use three significant digits. So that means we're going to round this to 0 0.179 moles. Now, 
how do we deal with compounds? Because they're a little bit different than the elements. However, it's not too far of a stretch because the uh, compounds are made up of elements, right? So we just got to figure out how many of each of the atoms are in a compound, and then we can use that to figure out what the molar mass of a compound is. So, find the molar mass of aluminum nitrate. So we have aluminum nitrate here, AlNO3, 3, and one aluminum, and its molar mass is 26.98 grams per mole. We have three nitrogens, each one is 14.01. We have nine oxygens, and it's 144 grams per mole. And we just add them all up. Gives us a total of 213.01 grams per mole. Remember with addition, we keep the number of decimal places. So your periodic tables have three decimal places on the um, um, molar masses from the periodic table. And so your answer here would have three, three decimal places instead of just the two that I've had in the end. Um, I was using an old periodic table when I made up this one. Okay. Um, Finding the molar mass of sulfuric acid. Uh, this I've done it as an example. Um, spend a few seconds to do the calculation. Video on pause while you're doing it. I'm just going to move along just to shorten the video. And we get 98.08 grams per mole. <clears throat> All right, this one, n 205 dinitrogen pentoxide. Again, pause me here. You should get 108.02 grams per mole. Third example, magnesium iodide. Pause me for a few minutes while you figure it out. You should get 278.11 grams per mole. Okay. It's fairly straightforward. Try this from your textbook. Um, actually, just before we do that, let's go and uh, review some of this. So here's the relationship between mass and moles. So if we go from mass to moles, we divide by the molar mass. Going back the other way, we multiply by the molar mass. We have to go through moles for these conversions. So molecules moles. We use Avogadro's number. Um, and then for atoms to molecules, it's just a matter of counting. Um, if we go atoms, moles to atoms, or atoms to moles, we use Avogadro's number again. Remember, Avogadro's number has to do with particle. So particles could be either atoms or molecules, depends on what you're talking about. Last thing then is that if you're going from molecules to atoms, all right. So the homework for this section then is page 177, numbers one to seven, page 178, one to nine. All right. This next section is on solutions. Some definitions that we need to know when we're dealing with solutions. Uh, first of all, a solution, if you'll remember from grade 9 and 10, it's a homogeneous mixture. Uh, it means it's the same throughout, so you can see one substance, even though that there's more than one substance in there. Secondly is the solvent. Solvent is simply the substance that's there in the usually the greater amount. And the solute, uh, that's the substance there that's there in the lesser amount and you dissolve your solute into the solvent. An example of that is if I were to use sugar and I were to dissolve some sugar into a glass of water, for example. The sugar is there in the lesser amount, it's the solute. There's lots of water, it's the solvent. The amount of sugar that you can dissolve in that glass of water, 
has is the property of solubility. Okay. Um, we measure solubility in various things. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. Another example is oil and water. Um, when you have oil and water, it won't dissolve, and so it's insoluble. Sugar, on the other hand, is soluble. How do we determine um, which one will dissolve in what? It really depends on the properties of that substance. And usually the rule that we go by is like dissolves like. In other words, the more the properties of the solute are like the properties of the solvent, the easier it will dissolve. So the property that we primarily look at is the property of, of, of polarity. And so remember back to our electronegativity from first unit. The electronegativity difference allows us to determine if a, uh, and the um, three-dimensional structure, those things allow us to determine whether or not a proper, or a compound is going to be polar or not. If your solute is polar and your solvent is polar, then the solute will dissolve in the solvent. If, however, one of them is polar and the other one is nonpolar, you're not going to have um, your solute dissolve, dissolving into your solvent. So nonpolar substances dissolve in nonpolar solvents. So think grease and paint thinner. As I mentioned, the electronegativity difference and the symmetry is used to determine the solubility of the compound in water. Now, there are some ionic compounds which are so ionic that the electrostatic attraction between the ions is greater than the attraction to the oppositely charged part of the water molecule. And so as a result, those types of compounds may be more difficult to dissolve in water, if at all. So they would have a low solubility. Now, we're going to measure how much solute is dissolved in the uh, solvent by uh, what we call the concentration. The concentration is essentially a measure of how much solute in how much solvent or solution, as it were. Um, molarity is the one that we're going to concentrate on primarily. And so the molarity, uh, molar concentration, capital C is the uh, symbol we give that, is the moles of solute divided by the volume of the solution. Moles of solute, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the uh, volume has to be in liters. Okay, So the units are always moles per liter. So the formula works out to be C equals N over V. The steps that we follow for these types of questions go like this. First of all, generally you're giving your solute a name uh, as a mass. So the mass of the solute then has to be converted to the moles of the solute. We use that molar mass of the substance for that. Then we determine the moles of the solute and from that we get the concentration by dividing by the volume of the solution. So here's an example. A uh, solution containing 6.15 grams of sodium chloride is dissolved in 6.00 times 10 to the 3 milliliters of water. What's the concentration of the solution in moles per liter? Alright, so first of all, the number of moles of the sodium chloride is based on the mass, so that's equal to the mass divided by the molar mass. And so we take 6.15 grams divided by molar mass for sodium chloride. We calculate that off the periodic table uh, in grams per mole. And so that gives us 0 0.105 and a bunch of decimal places moles. Now we need the volume. The volume is based on the 6.00 times 10 to the 3 milliliters. Now, times 10 to the 3 simply means 1,000, right? So that means 6,000 milliliters. And there's 1,000 milliliters in uh, a liter of water. So really, we're looking at 6 liters. So concentration is then number of moles divided by the volume, the 0 0.105 and change moles, uh, divided by 6 liters. And that works out to 1.7537255 times 10 to the minus 2 moles per liter. Now, your calculator may not 
automatically convert to scientific notation. It may have this number as 0 0.00175, sorry, 01753 and, and all the rest of the decimal places. So if that's the case, you don't necessarily have to convert to scientific notation at this point. Um, that's sometimes a little bit easier to do at the very end. Now, this being our final answer uh, would be true, except for one thing, we have to go back and look at the numbers that were given in the question, look at the scientific or the number of significant digits. And so this has to be rounded to 1.75, right? Three sig digs, 175. The next one is a three, so the five stays as five times 10 to the minus two moles per liter. Homework for this section then is page 188, numbers 19 and 23. Try those, uh, ask questions if you have any.